agroecology and regenerative agriculture. So I think most of us are aware of the problem. Um, nearly two thirds of the world's nitrous oxide emissions come from the application of nitrogen fertilizer in agriculture. Uh, nitrous oxides in atmosphere have doubled since 1961. Um, the photo is actually of the dust bowls in the um, Midwest, in um, or the grain belt in, in America from the 1920s. And that just shows what happens when there's consistent ploughing and um, the, the soil degrades to the point where it, it literally becomes like a desert. Um, so desertification of um, agricultural areas is a massive issue. Um, and it results in a lot of land grabs in um, places like the Amazon and rainforest because the way we've been farming is basically degrading our soils um, at a ridiculous rate. So the International Panel on Climate Change is special report on climate change and land in 2019. Livestock production is currently responsible for around a third of the global emissions and two thirds of that um, of agricultural methane. So interestingly, though, um, I didn't actually realise how um, much rice contributed to greenhouse gases, uh, which are actually responsible for about 24% of agricultural methane emissions. So from 2008 to 2017, it's important to note that the land actually absorbed 30% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions. And it's um, thought that the top one metre of soil contains three times as much carbon as is in the atmosphere. So the soil lution, um, Dr. Ratan Lau of Ohio State University says that by reforming farming and tillage practices around the world, soil can begin to reabsorb carbon from the atmosphere, which will lead to healthier soil as well as healthier climate. Um, he often talks about how um, it's kind of like pouring water from one glass into another um, because a significant amount of the actual um, carbon dioxide and methane in the atmosphere has come from the soil in the first place. So by applying proper husbandry techniques, we can get that soil back where it belongs back into the soil and maximise the soil's potential to reverse climate change. So currently, the UK signed the UN Climate Change Convention in Paris in 2015, aiming to increase soil organic carbon by 0.4%. So if every nation reached this ambitious target, the French government believes that 75% of global annual greenhouse gas emissions could be offset. Um, so that just shows the massive potential of helping to reverse climate change by carbon sequestration in the soil. So what is regenerative agriculture? Um, it's interesting, when I was looking for um, photos for this, slide this infogram actually came from um general mills which is a massive agricultural company um in the united states um they they manage the the farms that produce the grains for things like cereals like um cheerios those horrible sugary really like not very actually nutritious cereals um but it's just interesting to see that these big organizations are getting on board and basically we need industrial agriculture to get on board with this if we've got any chance of surviving um or working with nature which is the most important thing so uh, but it's a really useful infogram so the five core principles of regenerative agriculture are to minimize soil disturbance so um, a lot of farmers are moving away from kind of deep furrow plowing um, and using more appropriate tillage techniques. Um, maximizing crop diversity. So as well as um, your, your cash crop, your oats or your wheat, whatever grain it is you're growing. Um, there's also the technology now where um, farmers can under sow um, their crop with um, legumes and um, plants that help to um, get the nitrogen from the soil. So leguminous kind of crops. Um, also, it's really important to keep the soil covered because um, once you've harvested your crop, if um, you then plough it straight away and it rains or there's wind, that's literally just going to wash the soil away. Um, and also, so again, it's important to maintain living roots year round because it's actually the roots that make soil aggregation. It's the soil, it's the roots that make um, 
um, the soil structure by the sugars that they exude from, exude from the roots, but I'll talk about that a bit more in a minute. Um, and also a, a big part of um, soil health is reintegrating livestock back into the rotation. Um, there's a farmer in America, Gabe Brown, who is primarily a, a grain farmer, um, but he also, a big part of him becoming self-sufficient and being able to move away from inputs of um, nitrogen fertilizer, um, phosphorus and potassium, is by reintegrating livestock and the, the manure from the animals uh, when they're grazing off stubble um, or your, the crop that they've undersown actually helps to um, fertilize the soil and improve the soil health. So what's the difference between regenerative agriculture and agroecology? Um, regenerative agriculture is all the kind of principles we've just talked about, but um, it, it's not necessarily um, organic. Um, agroecology lends itself a bit more to kind of organic whole farm systems. Um, so th farming thrives when it works with local ecosystems by improving soil, plant quality through biomass. That basically means adding compost and by the biodiversity rather than battling nature with chemical inputs. So agroecological farmers seek to improve food yields for balanced nutrition, strengthening fair markets for their produce. So it's so important to have local um, resilient economies, you know, taking money away from the big corporations so that we can actually feed ourselves. Um, they also enhance healthy ecosystems and build on ancestral knowledge and customs. So a big part of agroecology is also social justice because um, industrialized agriculture is as bad as the pharmaceutical industry. In some ways it's, it's good and can be really helpful, but wherever there's too much corporate power, it just takes what means we're beholden to them. And if we want to survive and work with nature, um, we have to learn to do it ourselves and work together and support local markets. So who will feed us? Um, there are three billion small scale food producers worldwide and they're the ones producing 70% of the world's food. Um, that's a, a quote that comes from the farming um, and agriculture, sorry, the Food and Agriculture Organization. Um, peasant farmers in the global south actually harvest 53% of the world's crop calories consumed by humans. So that's approximately 80% of rice, 75% of ground nuts. Um, and when sustainable agriculture was adopted, average crop yields increased by 70, 79%. Um, since writing this presentation last year, I've actually found another study that disputes that and says that based on empirical evidence, more kind of observations, that um, peasant farmers actually only produce 50% of the world's food. But that's actually probably still significantly more than what we're actually led to believe by kind of um, this idea that industrialised agriculture is going to save the world. Um, you know, small scale farmers are a really, really important part of that equation. So um, the soil food web, um, I'm sure a lot of you are keen about your earthworms and composting, things like that. Um, I won't go into it. I don't have enough time at the moment. But basically, soil isn't just degraded rocks. Soil Good soil, healthy soil, is full of, um, has a whole ecology. It's got earthworms, um, bacteria, nitrifying bacteria, denitrifying bacteria, fungi, so mycorrhizal fungi that have um, symbiotic relationships with plants, saprophytic fungi, which help to break down um, compost and leaves and decaying matter and, and get the nutrients back into the soil. Um, and then there's a whole other myriad of organisms that, that feed on the worms and, and the other kind of arthropods. And, you know, it's a whole ecosystem. So aerated soil is healthy soil. Um, and the worms and other soil biology help to create the soil structure. So worm casings are really high in humates, which help to feed, um, you know, other organisms, the, the fungi. Um, and other decaying matter is also really important for fertility. Bear with me, I just need a swig of water. So um, above and below ground diversity is really important for um, a resilient, self-sustaining system. So, you know, if you've got problems with pests like aphids, they're the bane of my life. Um, 
you know, you want to encourage hoverflies because their larvae actually like feed on um, on the aphids and parasitoid wasps. Um, these are encouraged by um, flowers that have blue and yellow flowers, um, daisies and plants that are in the carrot family, um, clovers, they just love them. Um, it's also really good to try and um, encourage um, flowers all season as long as possible for both pollinators and these kind of beneficial insects, natural enemies. Leaf litter is also really important and having some areas of your garden which are kept as perennial beds um, as habitats for predatory beetles and overwintering ladybirds. Also moss, humus and manure are really good for predatory mites. So it's a whole ecosystem that helps to support a um, resilient system and a healthy, healthy garden. Um, and going back to what I said before about having um, diversity of crops, um, there's the above ground and below ground diversity in the root system and um, different plants actually help each other. They, they um, you know, some plants have much deeper roots. I mean, this is well known in permaculture. Um, you know, you've got your kind of plants with tap roots, which suck out different um, minerals and the plants actually have been shown to share share these different um, nutrients amongst themselves. So it really is amazing, you know, everything that um, Bill Mollison and, um, you know, the original David Holmgren, and the guys in permaculture, is actually starting to be improved by science. So it's really exciting times, actually. So um, I was talking about um, the plants exuding sugars. So healthy, happy plants also, um, you know, when they're photosynthesizing efficiently, um, really happy, lots of water and nutrients and all their needs met, they also produce a lot of root exudates. So they're actually releasing sugar from their roots, which help to feed soil bacteria. Um, and this is called the rhizosphere. So these really cool photos um, uh, by Niels Caulfield, um, where it's actually showing the kind of aggregation, the soil aggregation stuck to the roots. So if you do your weeding, because um, obviously you do need to control your weeding, um, your weeds, you know, it's good to have you know, dandelions for um, pollinating insects and beneficials, but you don't necessarily want them everywhere. So sometimes you need to pull them up, but um, you might see this on some of the weeds that you pull up. Um, and Joel Williams, who's um, a really eminent soil scientist and um, advises farmers, he says that um, research shows that roots are five times more likely to be converted into stable organic carbon than the equivalent of above ground carbon. So it's based, what he's saying is it's really, really important to have roots in the ground um, to increase the organic carbon content of soil. Um, glomalin was only discovered um, back in 1996, but it's actually um, a really, really sugary, rich um, protein that mycorrhizae make. Um, myco is um, Greek for fungi and rhizae is... Um, Greek for root. So basically, mycorrhizae is fungus root. Um, and basically, pretty much all land plants have this association with a um, fungus, which helps them to absorb um, phosphorus in the soil um, and um, to lesser degrees um, nitrogen and potassium, but it's mostly phosphorus. Um, so these are really, really important for self sufficient, healthy plants and getting away from adding, um, you know artificial fertilizers in more conventional agriculture. Um, but this picture um, from the um, United States Department of Agriculture shows soil before the glomalin was extracted um, and then the soil after extra extraction. So that third um, kind of sandy, it looks like sand basically where the soil has been extracted after the glomalin. So that just shows how, how important it is have um, the luscious, dark, humus-rich soil. It's, it's partly through the um, glomalin. But also what's really exciting about glomalin is that it actually takes 40 years to break it down. Um, and as I've already said, it's really, really high in carbon. So the more we can encourage mycorrhizae into the soil, we're basically buying ourselves 40 years of time um, by sequestering that carbon in the soil to implement things like renewable energy and other solutions that we need um, mulches and green manures are also really important, keeping the soil covered. So um, <clears throat> it's all part of your closed loop system. So adding things like a thin layer of grass, um, you know, to help feed your potatoes. 
really high in nitrogen, but you don't want to add too much because it turns into a horrible, slimy mess. It's kind of the same with, um, you know, your compost piles. Um, comfrey is a really great crop, um, you know, really great catch crop to grow alongside certain areas, and you can literally just um, cut it down after it's flowered, leave it to um, decompose into the soil, um, and it often has a second flush of flowers as well, and the bees are just all over it. Um, a lot of you probably know you can also make your comfrey teas, um, you know, fertilizer, which your plants just absolutely love, your tomatoes and such like. Um, uh, green manures are um, plants like um, buckwheat um, or phacelia that you that you sow as part of your rotation when you want to give the soil a bit of a break, and you, you can reincorporate them before they flower. Um, so there's lots of different kind of te techniques that um, farmers are, are employed, but also you can do this in your own garden as well. Biochar is also something that's really interesting because um, it's really, really high in carbon. Biochar is basically charcoal. So it's um, wood that has been burnt at a high temperature with um, oxygen um, limited. So it, it's a process called pyrolysis. So rather than the whole of the wood burning, the wood gases, so um, nitrogen, nitrous oxides and, and um, sulfur oxides basically go up into the atmosphere. Um, there are more efficient ways of, um, you know, the kind of ideal biochar production systems basically minimise those um, wood gases and burn them off at the same time. Um, uh, there is a local company, um, Say It With Wood, who make it from um, some of the smaller coppice wood that they can't sell, um, and I think they do it in retort kilns. So again, that, that minimises the smoke going off into the atmosphere. But biochar is really, really good when it's been activated at, and um, nitrogen um, when manure added to it because it, it's got, if you look at it under a microscope, it's got these little micropores that the mycorrhizae um, basically, you know, love to kind of colonise. Um, it also minimises um, the organic matter from being broken down somehow. Um, and I have worked on a farm, um, Swansea Soil Carbon, uh, which is amazing, has the best soil that I've ever seen. And I do a lot of gardening. Um, all the other soils that um, are really good are the ones that have a lot of roots in, a lot of um, trees, a lot of, um, you know, so-called weeds. They're, they're usually the ones that have the best soil. It's the bare soil that just breaks my heart when I'm digging through it. It's like sand or, you know, just hard clay with no kind of organic matter. Um, but it doesn't seem to matter how much organic matter you add, you know, wood chip, um, composted wood chips at the top of the soil or um, compost that you've made it just breaks down within six months and then you need to add more but by adding biochar um, because it originally comes from the rainforest um, in the Amazon called Terra Preta that's where the concept has been remembered from um, but there's basically areas in the Amazon basin that have soil that's nine metres deep and that's because the ancient people made this biochar and the um, forest soil hasn't broken down in all that time so that just shows how long it, it has sequestered the carbon in that way um so looking to biochar it's really exciting but i would recommend getting it from a local company um if you're in the herefordshire herefordshire worcestershire area could say it with wood um and they also have a lot of really good um um sweet chestnut coppice so they're really good guys to um to support locally Water management is another big issue. Um, this is something I really want to learn a lot more about. Um, in um, areas you can add swales, which are kind of, um, I don't actually know that much about it actually, but I just know that it's a certain way for helping to distribute the water um, throughout the, the land because um, a lot of, a lot of um, organic carbon can be lost into the atmosphere through um, drying and wetting of soil so you basically want to try and keep your soils um a similar moisture and that will just kind of keep the habitat stable and um reduce soil carbon being um lost as carbon dioxide beavers um also really interesting kind of whole system solution to um down 
downstream flooding, water attenuation. I met a great farmer called Chris Jones, and um, he's got a um, really large farm in, in Cornwall, and um, he recently um, introduced beavers onto his land, and he just said the amount of um, biodiversity has increased significantly and um, you know they're just naturally helping to to stop flood issues in the area and um, you know creating larger pockets of um, of land to keep the water in to reduce the kind of um, local flooding um, so that's also something really interesting to look into in more detail at home um, certainly good to have as many water butts as possible um, plants generally prefer um, rainwater anyway, rather than the chlorinated stuff that we drink. Um, and also it's good to have ponds and lakes where possible, good for wildlife, um, for natural predators like frogs. And um, uh, yeah, that would just kind of encourage the ecology to take care of your land. So um, what does agroecology or regenerative agriculture mean on an industrial, industrial scale? Um, so no till or minimum tillage or conservation tillage that's basically where rather than deep furrow ploughing um, farmers are only cultivating a, a thinner um, you know the top top layer of soil um, and there's a machine which um, has like pressurized air to force um, seeds into the soil and that's called direct drilling um, but a lot of the minimum tillage um, in, certainly in the UK uh, requires a dependence on glyphosate because um, often um, weeds are kind of managed through cultural um, ways like plowing up the soil and you know exposing the roots so that they dry um, and, and sort of kill them that way but um, unfortunately glyphosate is used a lot in this so um, we need to find other solutions for that in this country. Um, in places with drier climates they use a thing called a, a roller crimper which helps to break up um, the plants that you want to kill and then they get dried in the in the sun. But, um, you know, we do get a lot of um, rain here, even in the summer, so uh, you're not necessarily, necessarily guaranteed to, to kill the, the plants that you want to get rid of. So more research is required um, and shallow tillage may be more appropriate. Um, what the La LWA is a really great organisation called the Land Workers Alliance, so I'd highly recommend you check out their resources and um, sign up to their newsletter. But they talk more about appropriate tillage, um, you know, as opposed to like the dependence on glyphosate. Catch crops, cover crops, fodder crops. Um, this is kind of like the under sowing that I was talking about. So including nitrogen fixing plants such as lucerne and clover to help, um, you know, give that exchange of nitrogen naturally with your, with your cash crop. Um, Amending nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium and micronutrient balance. Um, so a lot of farmers are making the most of the nitrifying bacteria in the soil, um, as I said before. Um, they're also using a lot of foliar sprays because by um, kind of amending the micronutrient balance of plants, it often gives them the right kind of um, nutrients they need to make enzymes to make them... Um, make the enzymes that they need for, for their plant defense. Um, you can also add beneficial microbes. Um, a lot of biodynamic farmers use compost teas um, and that's using the, the local um, microorganisms from dung from cows. Also maximizing mycorrhizae to encourage the fungal dominated soil. So that's where um, plowing less is better because if you constantly plough the land, you're breaking up these mycelial networks. And as I said before, we want to try and encourage um, the dominance of mycorrhizae just to um, help sequester carbon for longer in the soil. Beetle banks are also really good for breaking up large fields and encouraging beneficial insects. Um, alley cropping, which is planting trees um, in rows in between your um, grain. Um, there's a really interesting study at the moment, actually, that's just coming out in October by University of Reading, and they found that um, in temperate climates, they, they looked at six farms, and um, the amount of um, bumblebees increased by 2.4 times, were 2.4 times higher in arable agroforestry systems um, than ones without trees in, um, and also they found that... Um, 
uh, other beneficial organisms like hoverflies increased were, were double. Um, also, as I said, repairing improvement in water and wetland conservation um, is, is, is also another important part of it, um, as well as biochar. So is there a place for livestock? Um, livestock do have a bad rep. Um, veganism is becoming um, really popular. Um, I certainly think it's important to cut down the amount of eat meat we eat and eat better quality meat. Um, and scenes like this, this is like a, um, a livestock farm in New Zealand with thousands and thousands of cattle. Um, and it's just really unsustainable. Um, all these, these big feedlots where cattle are kept inside artificially, um, they do cause a lot of pollution. I'm not denying that at all. Whereas if you look at this, um, animals that are allowed to forage naturally and completely grass fed, um, because obviously in the industrial um, instances, there's a lot of problem with feeding stock um, imported soya, which is grown in the Amazon. I mean, this is what I was talking about in terms of land grabs. The land is stolen from the local native people by the corporations. And it's just, it's, it's unacceptable. It's abhorrent. Um, whereas holistic grazing there certainly is a place for this. There's a lot of um, places in the UK that um, would really struggle to support other livestock. So there is certainly a case for, um, you know, local communities um, continuing to grow um, beef and, and sheep. Um, so this is a photo of a beef suckler herd at Croom Court, which is um, local to Worcestershire, um, and they're employing holistic grazing. So holistic grazing is basically mimicking nature because in nature, herbivores um, are a really important part of the cycle. And if you look at the, the pictures at the bottom, um, there's dung beetles carrying the dung into the soil and really helping the soil ecology because, as I said before, herbivores are a natural part of life cycle. So it's a really important part of whole farm, um, whole farm systems for resilience. Um, this is a photo of um, um, a place in um, Africa, I think it's Zimbabwe, and it's Seth it it's Khan, and he's been doing holistic grazing. So you basically keep, keep the cattle in a small area, let them graze a certain amount, but not so that it completely... Um, eats the top of the grass, um, which causes the roots to die. Um, because plants have a root to shoot ratio. Um, so the animals are kept in small areas and then moved on before they overgraze the ground. And so if you look at um, the, the top left photo in 2004, um, that, gra that ground has been bare for decades. Um, after a year of the holistic grazing, starting to annuals appear, 2006, there's densely packed cover, and by 2013, there's deep-rooted perennials, and um, just the, the ground is re-establishing with um, plants, which is going to stop the issue of desertification. Um, I'd highly recommend looking at um, a TED Talk um, by, I can't remember his name right now because I've got a migraine, um, but I'll, I'll try and remember at the end. But there's a really, really great TED Talk about how... Um, mob grazing can um, heal the world and help to reverse climate change. Um, so as well as um, improving the soil, um, obviously plants that are grown on healthy soil have uh, much more nutrient dense. So there's no such thing as cheap food. There's always a hidden cost with food. The Sustainable Food Trust has done a really good report on the hidden cost of food in 2019. Um, and there's a lot of um, costs that are passed on to other industries um, in terms of health, cost of billions, loss of ecosystem, ecosystem biodiversity is like 7.8 billion. Um, but that's a really interesting report to look at. Um, also, if you check out the Real Food campaign, um, just sort of trying to get a point, the issue of nutrient dense food, um, and going back to what I said about General Mills, they might be using regenerative agriculture, but 
processed foods are not nutrient dense. Um, you need to eat as many whole foods as possible. And basically, the closer it is to being a vegetable or, or um, you know, less processed it is, it will have lost less nutrients in the way, on the way. So what can you do in your garden? Um, try and keep soil covered um, by using under sowing crops, um, also adding green manures. So protect the soil and maintain um, the living root system. So if you've got weeds growing, um, but you don't need to, to plant straight away, just leave the weeds and only cover them right before you actually do your sowing. Um, also, you want to increase biodiversity above and below ground. Um, in small spaces, no dig might be appropriate. It's kind of difficult in this area because we have a lot of heavy clay. Um, so, you know, I, I do find you do need to fork over the soil quite a lot, but I certainly don't do the whole double digging thing um, like maybe the RHS recommends. I just kind of fork it over a bit and, and um, sow my seeds. Um, also encourage mycorrhizae by adding wood mulch, uh, wood chip, um, having areas of permanent grass and don't over mow. Um, so avoid, you can also avoid pulling up plants and just cut them off at the ground and leave the root system in place because that helps, that minimizes disturbance in the soil. Um, and also it's important to rotate non-mycorrhizal plants. So brassicas don't actually have mycorrhizal associations. They're one of the few that, that don't. Um, so obviously an area that's kept um, under brassicas for a long time, all those mycorrhizae will die, but also that's not good for your pest populations as well. Um, but by, as part, that's another beneficial point of your rotation, uh, but having different plants, you're also encouraging your mycorrhizae. Um, also plant trees and perennials where, where possible. Um, and also, as I said, activated biochar is, a, is also a possibility to really help you build soil. So each time you add your compost or wood chip or um, turn in your, your green mulch, um, but adding the biochar at a certain point in your rotation, um, at Swansea Biochar, they add it when um, they, they sow the or they plant the potatoes. Um, and yeah, you can get that locally from Say It With Wood. So what else can I do? Um, consumer power is so important. If you don't have a garden or you don't have time to do your own gardening, um, just support local small scale farmers and independent enterprises as much as possible. Um, so local to me in Malvern, uh, places like Green Link and Well Meadow Fields where they're growing some of their own veg. The fold's also really good, and there's a really great farm in Evesham called Oxton Organics. Support the Land Workers Alliance, they're absolutely brilliant, do a lot of important work. Um, I'd highly recommend joining up their, um, their newsletter and doing their campaigns. Um, if, if, you, if you like to eat meat, um, I'd highly recommend getting your meat from a farm that um, is, is uh, credited by the Pasture Livestock Association, Pasture Fed Livestock Association, sorry. Um, there's also a lot of really interesting resources on the Pesticides Action Network. So there's actually a guide for um, gardeners on how, on how you can manage your pests without pesticides. It's also really good to support the Woodland Trust because they actually um, help farmers plant trees on their land as part of valley cropping um, for their livestock and as part of the arable systems. Um, eat organic wherever possible. Um, I know it can be really expensive, but, you know, if you're shopping at Aldi or whatever, just try and get your organic carrots from there. Um, so look out for the Organic Farmers and Growers Certification Symbol and Soil Association and lobby your MPs and the government because, you know, we need to use our voice and tell them what we want. They might not listen, but we need to put up a fight, guys. Come on. And what to say to your MPs. Um, so the Agroecology Fund recommends... Recommendations for policymakers include stop all support for land grabs and promote access to land for small scale farmers. Access to land is a real issue. Um, that's something that the Land Workers Alliance talk about a lot as well. Um, promote local and small scale food systems and markets. Support local exchange of seeds and community seed banks. Um, the actual um, issue with GM is that they often have... Um, uh, a caveat where the farmers can't well because they they've been made in a lab the farmers can't grow them on they're not true to form 
Um, so it means that farmers get stuck in in being beholding to the corporations and having to keep paying out for these seeds from the corporations, whereas actually it's part of our natural right as human beings to be able to save our own seed if we choose to. Um, also, ask the MPs to encourage and support agroecological training um, and ensure that farmers' perspectives are represented in decisions made through meaningful consultation and support to local farmers' organisations. We have to work with these guys because they're doing an amazing job at supplying us with really amazing food. And um, a lot of them are really stuck by by the um, monetary systems in place. So um, it's really important that, you know, we, we ask for farmers' perspectives to be represented. Also, uh, say no to the deregulation of GMOs. Um, there's going to be a... a a public consultation in autumn um, as part of the new agriculture bill, which is going to become law since we've left the European Union. Um, and what um, the corporate bodies want in the government to do is to deregulate this new kind of um, genetically modified um, technique, which is called CRISPR. Um, but I'm really concerned about how that will affect the organic industry. Um, and also, I don't think there's enough um, research on unintended consequences. It's just all driven by money. Um, so these are things that I would recommend. So are there any questions? Hello, Jenna, and hello, everyone at home. My name is William. I'm helping to run the festival here. Um, thanks, Jenna. That was a fascinating talk. Um, Thank you. Loads and loads uh, of information to take home there. Uh, we've had a question in from Hamish. I should say, by the way, we've got about five minutes left, so okay. not, not too long. Question from Hamish. He asks, what are your views on rewilding? Um, that's really interesting, actually. I know the NEP um, are having a lot of success with, re with rewilding. Um, to be honest, I need to research it more. Um, I think what they're doing at NEP is really amazing. Um, but... I, I have worked as a coppice worker and that's a very much um, kind of industrial landscape um, and a lot of the benefit um, to the to the butterflies and um, nightingales comes from the fact it was a really productive landscape. So um, I really like the idea that um, farms can be really productive but also um, beneficial for wildlife as well. Um, but yeah, there's definitely a place for rewilding, but I'm concerned about just saying we're going to rewild everything because it's really important that we feed 9.5 billion people in the coming future. Um, but it is a complex issue and I need to look at it more personally. <laughs> How much do you think COVID is going to change precisely that issue? Uh, again, that's a really good question that I want to look into more myself. I'm actually going to be doing a master's in September because I really, really want to study this stuff. Um, yeah, I think I am really concerned about COVID. I think I think there are going to be um, food shortages um, uh, because of the disruption to the su supply chain. Um, so again, it's another good reason to kind of support your local farmers. Um, I think I think the um, the corporations and the governments are going to say that things have to be a certain way because of COVID, but I think we need to look a lot deeper and it's about local resilience. Again, I would always say it's about local resilience. Try and grow as much food as you can um, or, you know, work together. You know, this is this is the, the bit, one of the positive things about COVID is actually having a bit more time to do gardening and, um, you know, try and get an allotment or share an allotment with someone or get involved with community gardening. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm really concerned about certain um, corporate agendas and trying to push through um, things which come from um, a paradigm of fear. And actually what what we all need to be working towards is empowering ourselves. And it's not just about food sovereignty. Food sovereignty is, is being able to feed oneself and you know be sustainable in that way. But it's also about being sovereign ourselves. And if we don't agree with something, if something feels wrong in our body in terms of like, hang on, that's a really negative message. I don't agree with that. We need to, we need to listen to that and, 
and do the things that bring us joy and make us feel positive and that bring people together. Great. That's a fascinating answer. We've got one more question uh, um, coming from Gwyneth. She asks, uh, how much can we trust the supermarkets when it comes to their claims about organic and locally sourced food? Should we just take what they've put on the packages as, you know, as fact or do we need to be a bit more discerning? That's really interesting, actually. No, that is, I mean, the organic farmers and growers, this is why it's really important to look for those specific certifications because they have been rigorously certified. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. So I do think you can, you can trust that. Um, but yeah, certainly, you know, there, there is a whole spectrum of organic and, you know, for instance, if you buy organic chicken from your local farmer, they've probably got a flock of 50. Whereas if you get organic chicken from supermarkets, it will be in a warehouse with 2000 where theoretically they can go outside and forage, but because of the pecking order, that, it's not necessarily going to be true for all of them. So, yeah, you do need to be discerning. But, you know, if funds are tight, it's still better to buy organic at the supermarket than not at all. So, I mean, I, I kind of pick and choose. I get some things from the supermarket, but make sure it's organic. But then I try and support my local shops as much as possible. I mean, the kale is just so much nicer <laughs> than, than, you know, the stuff that's come from Spain. It's not to say that the Spanish farmers aren't good. I've had some amazing Spanish carrots. But it's just, you know, in terms of importation, it's obviously not as fresh. It's also got a higher carbon footprint. Um, I mean, at the moment, we're only 60% self-sufficient. And the NFU are like have been shouting at, at the government, you know, to just be really wary about these trade deals with the US because um, they want to make sure that anything that's imported it's, that still has the same high standards as we have in the UK because our standards are pretty good even if it's not organic there's leaf um, you know there's a lot of farmers which are doing a lot of the kind of regenerative techniques and you know minimizing trying to minimize inputs great fantastic well thank you so much to Jenna for that talk um, and it's, her talk is now available uh, to, to watch back on our YouTube channel um, we will have another event starting in 15 minutes time on our YouTube channel and if you have the time and can spare the funds please do go to our uh, Just Giving page justgiving.com forward slash crowdfunding forward slash HGF where you can uh, make a donation to our two beneficiaries but for now thanks to Jenna and see you next time thank you Will Cheers. thanks everyone Thank you. Bye.